This is Phil Vincent, Dr. Philip Fitch Vincent, who's a, a well-known author. Um, he's probably dedicated the majority of his career to character education. He was an educator, um, taught every grade level, was an administrator at the school and district level. Uh, he also now has been running the niche publishing company in character education, mm -hmm. character development group for quite some time. Um, a lot of original books come out, plus he distributes other books in the field, and he's written a lot of those books as well. He's also one of the foremost consultants um, in character education around the country, including bringing in some large federal grants and um, being involved in them in West Virginia, North Carolina, and other places, uh, as well as just being brought out to help schools and districts figure out how to do this well. So he's seen it from so many sides. So, Phil, I'm really happy that you're here with us Thank you, Marvin. and taking the time to answer some questions. Give us your thoughts about character ed. Good. Yeah. Glad to be here. Okay. Let me, you know, let me ask you first, why character ed? Where did the passion come from? Um, I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate. And from that, I somehow worked my way into a teaching position. Uh, I was teaching uh, fourth and fifth graders uh, for a while. Then I moved to Alaska and continued my teaching career there. Uh, I was very interested in teaching philosophy to kids. Uh, very interested in the, uh, some of the work that was being done Montclair State University in teaching philosophy to kids and then somewhere along the line I discovered Kohlberg and I got very interested in that and decided after teaching for some years in Alaska to um, pursue my doctorate. Mm -hmm. Ended up at North Carolina State and was fortunate to study under uh, two great people, John Arnold in middle school education and Norman Sprenthal in um, child development uh, social and moral development, uh, the, the broad range of Norm's work. And I just got interested in it, did my dissertation in the field, then went back into the schools and slowly but surely started deciding this was what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to focus in social and moral education and was fortunate enough I've been able to make a living at it. Well, what were you able to do while you were working actively as an educator, while you were teaching or even while you were an administrator to make character ed flourish in the classrooms of schools where you had some leverage? Well, as a teacher, I was very fortunate that I received excellent training in leading seminars. So I, I actually took philosophy into public schools and taught philosophy. Uh, but I didn't do it in a very didactic manner. What we tried to do was a very discovery manner of the wisdom uh, of the uh, uh, philosophers through questioning skills. And, and later on, I even adopted uh, some of your stuff that you did mm -hmm. in uh, getting kids to think and reflect. Uh, through using questions uh, and getting kids to learn how to ask questions themselves to others so that as a seminar leader, a great seminar was when I was talking maybe 5% of the time, the rest of the time the kids were doing it. So it was some skill-based instruction I was able to do. Um, I was also able to bring this idea of philosophy and teach it, starting with kids in kindergarten. Uh, years earlier, I did a series of books with a guy named Joseph Hester called the Philosophy for Young Thinkers series, which regrettably is still in publication. Uh, because I sure would like to change a lot of it. But we started with kindergarten kids and worked all the way up through middle school. So I was able to do that. And then part of my work as an administrator was to look at school climate. Uh, how do we enhance this, the climate uh, for boys and girls and also for the adults in a building? What do we do? How do we treat each other? So I was very fortunate to be able to approach it from a uh, teaching perspective with my particular interest, but also to look at it from a um, um, system perspective in, in helping people change schools and create better climate. Well, let me ask you your own question. How do you as an administrator change school climate in a way that promotes character development? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is commit that this is something, this is a priority. I, I yeah. honestly believe that's the key thing. I believe leadership is the key. Mm -hmm. Second thing that I believe administrators have to do is they have to walk the walk and talk the talk. They have to to uh, give the example of being a moral compass in the life of schools, how they deal with kids, uh, how an administrator would deal with parents and talk with parents, bring parents in uh, to discuss what is best for their kids. Then I believe that that person has to empower other people to do it well, to get people trained. I think training is the key thing. And I don't say that because I'm a consultant. Find someone else. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But people have to be trained. They have to read about this. And they have to make plans. And finally, I believe a top flight administrator knows this will not happen overnight mm -hmm. and has to have a yeah. sense of perspective that we're going to work at this for two, three, four, five years. And let's look at where we were and where we are and look at this as continuous improvement into the climate of the, of the school. 
how do we fuse it into the curriculum? Well, that's not an easy thing to do. So we take steps into that. Perhaps we realize we need some training in seminar-based instruction, or we need some training in questioning skills, or uh, maybe how we can fuse this into the writing. So we, we, we take this as a journey, not as uh, this year's model. One of the things that concerns me is that so many schools will jump on character education this year, a special reading thing next year, bullying the year after, rather than giving it a chance to develop a, a comprehensive idea of what we as the adult stakeholders and in many ways the students in a building would like to have. Mm -hmm. And that takes time to do that. It's not a program, it's a process. So what I'm hearing is those administrators, one, have to value it. Yes. Two, they have to model it. They have to show what they want. Three, they have to invest in their staff through the professional development. Yes. And four, they have to be patient, stay the course. Understand it's going to take a while, stay the course. Yes, stay the course. And I think that is one of the difficult things in, a, in an era that wants change immediate, wants results immediate. I just don't think this, actually I don't think anything in education that's meaningful will, will occur that mm -hmm. way. I think we have to learn to stay the course. It's much like investing. If you're investing for this quarter, you're in trouble. If you're investing for the long run, you're probably going to be successful. Now, you've been known for you know, lots of different areas of interest. You talked about seminar methods and other things. So, but one of the things you're known for um, now, partly because of your probably your primary book currently, is this notion of civility right. and how important civility is in the classroom and the school and how it's really core to character education. Right. So I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about why, that's, why you see that as so important, why you focus so much attention on it. Well, partially, I think it's how I define civility. Um, civility is not just manners, although I think manners are incredibly important. Um, Tom Lacona, I think, has referred to manners as many morals, and I think that's right on the money. Uh, so I do want to have an environment to where we are modeling good manners to boys and girls, that we're, we're using polite words, that we ask boys and girls, please, thank mm -hmm. you, excuse me, that we're modeling it, and, and that we also have dialogues with kids about the importance of politeness, of basic civilities. Uh, because I believe that is a lubricant of society, it's a lubricant of a school, I, to teach children how to learn to listen to others and then give opinions, to learn to disagree without being disagreeable. I think that's a very, very important step in all schools, I would argue in every aspect of society. But by itself it's inadequate. Now I used the example of Eddie Haskell from Leave it to Beaver, <laughs> those who are old enough. Eddie had impeccable manners, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to trust Eddie at that particular time, obviously playing a character, sure. to be in charge of, or to be the babysitter uh, mm -hmm. type situation. Sure. So it, manners simply aren't enough. We have to go beyond that. Um, to me, a, a civil school also grapples with difficult issues. It talks about, uh, we address issues of being more humane, but also looking at what is human about humans. We, we, we struggle with issues of right and wrong. We look at documents. We look at it appropriately developmentally. But to me, in high school, we ought to be reading powerful ideas, ideas that in some ways are contradictory of one to the other, having kids grapple with this. But to grapple with it in a seminar-type setting to where they are listening to others, agreeing, disagreeing, exchanging ideas, and growing intellectually. So they'll be able to make a a statement as they get older. They'll be able to, when they see incivility or unethical behavior, they would be able to say, that is wrong. Well, how do I know it's wrong? I know it intellectually this is wrong. And the third part is, when we were looking at the definition of the word civility, we, we came across the idea that it's also something we do with people, that a civil society takes care of other people. So I'm a firm believer that a civil school is also one that everyone is in service to everyone else. We find opportunities for kids to serve others in the schools. We, we take on helping those that have particular needs. We uh, address the issues of bullying and that we will not bully. We will rise above that. Uh, as kids get older, we have these kids in our communities participating in boards. In other words, to serve because a civil society, much as a civil school, demands that we break, as Walter Percy called, the suck of self, and that we interact with others. And I think that is critically important, uh, that a civil school is in service, is challenging itself intellectually, but also has good manners, good um, uh, approaches of how we deal with people, how we um, treat others. 
and that all that together to me enhances learning mm -hmm. uh, and it also enhances the social and moral development of everyone, not just the kids, but also the adults in the building. That's interesting. As you talked about civil society and a civil school, I kept thinking that as when we use the term civil school, we often reduce it to manners. When we think about civil society, we think of it much broader than simply manners. So somehow when we're thinking about kids, we're, you know, watering down the notion of civility and what you're doing in your book and, and your mission in this is bringing back the richness of the term civility right. to schools, which is a, is a real service. Um, a lot of folks nowadays, not just nowadays, a lot of folks have historically, but including nowadays, said um, schools can't afford to do the stuff that you and I are so concerned with, character education and social emotional learning and so on, um, civic education and what have you, that No Child Left Behind pushes towards core academic uh, achievement, um, the fact that we may be falling behind other similar nations in student achievement, says that um, the world economy is shifting, challenges us to have kids who have um, capitalist rich competencies and so on, um, dwindling resources for schools, says we can't afford to do this. Uh, so what do you say to this whole line of argumentation that this notion of civility is nice and character is nice, but that should be the community, the school, the church, other places. Schools can't afford to focus on that. I would argue that if we do not focus on that, uh, our schools will become bankrupt. And I am not a, normally a pessimistic person, but for instance in North Carolina, we are so short of teachers. And when you interview and find out how come teachers leave schools, Duke University did a study of this with first year teachers. It has to do with the climate of the school and the leadership of the administration. It's not about the money. It's not about, oh, I don't like teaching third grade. I'd rather teach fourth, therefore I'm going to leave. That's not the reason people leave. Mm -hmm. I believe that the climate of the school is the greatest predictor of the academics, that, of any notion that I've seen of, 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 of how we assess schools. If teachers have more time to teach, kids have more time to learn. That's the bottom, uh, the bottom line. Um, now, as far as no child left behind, I think there's some real issues in that. Uh, we talk about wanting to have brighter and brighter kids. I happen to believe our children are bright enough. Uh, if you take a look at patents, if you take a look at all of the innovation, how still what happens and what we do drives so much of the world intellectually, artistically in so many ways. I believe that we're smart enough in this country. The question is, are we going to be good enough? Are we going to look at our school and our communities as a society in which we all participate in? And to, to borrow a little bit from Dewey, if we want to have that, then we have to start growing it. We're not born knowing how to do this, but our schools can take an opportunity to do this. And furthermore, I think the parents want this. One of the questions mm -hmm. I always ask parents is, your child makes the A honor roll, and isn't that wonderful? And it is. A, B honor roll. My mother would have loved A, B, C honor roll probably uh, growing up. It's a wonderful thing. Your child does well academically, um, shines in all assessments. A week later, if someone were to come to you and say, um, your child's doing really well in school, but I just got to tell you, your child is the nicest, kindest child. You can always count on your child being at the hospital when he or she has said that um, uh, he will be there or she will be there to volunteer. You can always count on your child. As a parent, what compliment means the most to us? Mm -hmm. I would argue the second one. At least in my home, we expect the first one. We expected decent grades. We hoped for the second one, that somehow the combination of uh, Cindy's and my work with Mary Catherine, um, the school's work, the faith community's work, uh, the athletics, and all of that would somehow help develop her uh, to where she would have the potential to become a person of uh, high moral character. So my sense is that America will stand on our virtue. Uh, it will stand on a nation that's willing to tackle the difficult issues that we face without separation dividing. Actually, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be a Democrats and Republicans and others working together again instead of apart. That let's break some of the nasty um, rhetoric down. Uh, let's have a rethinking of who we are as people and how we want to interact with each other. And I believe the schools are a great place to start with that. I think parents want that also. Uh, I know my daughter's smart enough. I just pray she's good enough. Let me just give you another example. You're talking about with parents, because I think this is important. 
it's something that we all need to realize, and that is that our children can make straight A's in school and still flunk life. And that is something we need to always put in a proper position that, yes, I want my child to work hard in school, but I want my child to develop other competencies also. Um, I would love for my daughter to have the opportunity to go to, a, uh, to Harvard or Yale or Duke or something like that if she chose to do that in graduate school or something. But in order for her to get there, her character is going to drive that as much as her intellect. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I want her to make excellent grades as an undergraduate. But I also know that if her character isn't there, those grades probably are not going to follow. And also, she may run the risk of being a very bright person who will choose to make horrible decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen ample examples of that in the last 20, 30 years. You're, you're a, both a publisher and distributor of resources yes. to educators, mostly about character ed or related issues like right. bullying and so on. Um, Thinking out in the future and knowing schools that you know as, you know as to what educators really need, in this case we'll say tangibly, to have in their hands, whether it's a curriculum, a video, a book, or whatever it is, ideally what would, what, what would you want to produce for them that you think educators really need most now to be able to be effective in fostering the character development of kids? I've been thinking about this. It's interesting you're asking this question. and. Um, I think we need several things. Here's what I think we need to do. I think we need to have some great readings of books to inspire us. Um, Hal Urban's uh, books, Life's Greatest Lessons. I think that's, that's a great read. I also believe we need to get beyond simply what's been written in character ed. And let's start looking at some of the social-emotional um, uh, learning pieces. Uh, Mo Elias's work uh, and, and others that, f I'll just use his name, that flow from there. I believe we, ideally, I would like to see the social-emotional learning people together with the people focusing in character education and starting to write together ideas for uh, schools, uh, building, a, building social, emotional, and moral excellence in schools. Because I do believe the social-emotional people are correct. We need to teach skills on, on how this works. But we also need to have the, some of the idea with character education that there are standards of excellence that these skills, if we develop, will help us reach. Uh, so I would like to um, see a lot more work coming out in that area. Uh, to continue reading uh, stuff like what Hal Urban writes. Also, I think it's very important that we know the research in the field. I'm very pleased with the work that um, uh, the Journal for uh, Research and Character Education is doing now. I uh, refer people to that. It's, it's, it's worth reading the articles. You don't have to read them all but just to, to get some additional knowledge in that area. And finally, I, I would like for people to recognize it's important to have a bullying, to address bullying in your schools. But if that's all you're doing, you're, you're simply putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We've got to think deeper in that bullying occurs when the climate allows it to occur. So that if we want a social, emotional, and morally uh, uplifting and strengthening climate, we can have those materials, but we must focus on the overall goals. So ideally, um, I'd like to see a lot more materials out with combinations of people thinking holistically. Thank you, Phil. It was a pleasure having the conversation with Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks for a delightful conversation.